Heavenly Father, we come to you by the blood of Jesus Christ with nothing good in us but thy spirit and nothing good upon us but thy blood. And we plead now that blood before the throne of God as a propitiation for all of our sins. And we plead the perfect sinless life of the Lord Jesus Christ as imputed to us by our faith in his resurrection and as our sole grounds of answer to prayer now. And we pray that as we are in the Son, and those that are in the Son, we would all be one in the Spirit, and that we'd be in agreement around the Word of God this day. In Jesus Christ's name, Amen. Now, I'm going to preach to the topic, as I said, of the death of a nation. The calamity of national sin. If you notice in Psalm 33, verse 12, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. This doesn't apply just to the nation of Israel. It would apply to any group of people that could be configured or construed to be a nation as being blessed whose God was the Lord of heaven and earth. And even in the time of Israel's nativity and when they first came into the land, they were blessed when they were not as such a nation when they are going in under Joshua. And even though they had individual sinners amongst them, that walked contrary to the will and word of God, they were blessed in their deeds of national warfare. When they were established under Saul, God blessed them despite their wickedness and seeking to have a king instead of the Lord as their God by giving them David to rule over them. God in His sovereign power does whatsoever pleases Him, and when it pleases Him to form in a nation a group of people for Himself to call forth His praise, that nation will be blessed. This nation experienced that blessing in its inception, in its founding. Because whether a man was a heathen or an infidel or a true Christian, a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, there was a set of laws that went forth. There was a common law amongst the people in this nation that demanded that there be no open blasphemy of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that demanded that the magistrates be Christians in practice and honor Christian principles in their adjudication of local and civil affairs and even national affairs, there was an acknowledgement of God as being the Lord of the nation. And the nation was blessed. Why? Upon the piece of metal uh, that was oddly enough cracked, and I believe that's very symbolic, uh, it read this, Leviticus 25.10 Thusly it read on the liberty bell, And ye shall hallow the fiftieth year, and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. A proclamation of liberty. Now there can be no liberty where there is no acknowledgement of God, where there is no acknowledgement of Christ, and where is there, there is no honor to His Word. Psalm 119 verse 45 And I will walk at liberty, for I seek thy precepts. The psalmist wrote, for this cause, he would be able to walk at liberty because he sought the precepts, that is the word of God. He sought the testimonies of the Lord. He sought the law of the Lord. He sought the word of God. He sought his statutes. He sought his judgment. But when men forsake the statutes, the testimonies, the judgments, the precepts, the law, the word of God, they forsake their own mercy. And he said, I will walk at liberty, for this is the cause, I seek thy precepts. He did not say he obeyed every one of the precepts, but he sought them. Um, again, in Proverbs 13, the Bible reads thus, it says, Whoso despiseth the word shall be destroyed, but he that feareth the commandment shall be rewarded. He that feareth. So even those that would say you must keep the law must admit that liberty doesn't come from the keeping of the law, but it comes from seeking God's precepts. It comes from seeking His statutes, His judgments and testimonies, and seeking to do them. In other words, having a heart right with God. Not necessarily, or meaning in the Word of God, that you keep every last one because no man has kept them. Which of you keep the law, Jesus said. John chapter 7, verse 18, 19 in there. But 
None kept the law, and yet when a man with a humble and contrite heart seeks to submit himself to the moral law of God as embodied in the sinless life of the Lord Jesus Christ and seeks to conform himself to divine commandments in the New Testament, there is a blessing. And that blessing does not just provide him with a personal, solical, spiritual liberty within that breaks forth without and causes him to have a personal freedom, but it swells into the freedom of a whole nation. It grows into the freedom of a whole group of people that are touched, that are blessed, that are moved by personal liberty within numbers of souls in their group. Um, the people who will hear in faith and are enlightened by a right reading of the Word of God will find the lasting blessing of personal liberty bestowed upon them. Amen. That was what happened uh, in our nation between the landing of the people in Plymouth and South in Virginia and the actual war for independence against a tyrannical power. There was a liberty that was internal within the men that settled this land, not all of them, but many of them, yeah. and not every last one, but particularly in the preachers. They had a personal liberty because Christ had made them free and they were free indeed. And they preached this freedom and this liberty from the galling yoke of bondage, the galling yoke of sin, because he that committeth sin is the servant of sin. They preached the righteousness of Christ and the salvation of God as the only means whereby men might be made free. And this broke out and broke forth into the freedom of a whole nation Amen. from a tyrannical yoke of a insane, devil-possessed, Catholic-controlled king. Amen. Now, look to James 1.23. I'm going to cite from some historical sources. And when you turn to James chapter 1, verse 23 through verse 25, I want to point out something and remind you of something. What my life, and particularly what my ministry is all about, is the preaching of God's Word. And I'm going to demonstrate that in this sermon today that the answer to the death of our nation and the calamity of national sin is personal righteousness. Amen. It's personal holiness. It's personal piety. It's not banding together with a bunch of people that don't believe what we believe to seek to do something physical. Amen. Because only if something spiritual occurs within the heart and soul of numerous men will there be any true liberty. And the great enemy of your soul, Satan, personified by the Romish religion and pagan religion in general, will ever encroach upon liberty and seek to bring souls into bondage. And this was recognized by our founding fathers. And uh, I say founding fathers, I do not say that as if they were my personal father. Call no man on earth your father. But so those that are acknowledged as the founding fathers. And I'm going to read a few short sections of some things that they said. But in the time we now live in, I'm going to point this out, too, to the Internet listener. Um, I am indeed a pastor, but we have a biblical fellowship. We have what is called a house-to-house -house or home fellowship. We do not have a sign out front that says, Peace to all who pass by, and all welcome. All are not welcome. Only people that are tried and proven through long intercourse, one with another, to be true Christians, not with mouth, but in the heart, are welcome here. That's the kind of churches that they had in New England in the 1700s. Men that were profane, that were unholy, that were despisers of God and rejectors of Christ, were not welcome. They were shunned. They might have been dealt with in a daily discourse of commerce. They may have been horse traders or farmers. They may have bought bales of hay from them, but they were not welcomed into fellowship with the saints of God. And anyone that would seek admittance to fellowship with the saints of God was examined closely. Their manner and habit of life, what they believed, what they professed, were all brought up and forced out of them to see if indeed they possessed or seemed to possess the truth. But there were many false professors even in those days that infiltrated the churches of God and brought in the leaven of heresy, the leaven of Arminianism, the leaven of hypocrisy. And so too it is at this time. Amen. And 
I want to point out where you are now. With the latest events, and this is February 1st of 2009, in the current events in your nation, we have now seen radical changes away from the Constitution that was written and was approved along with its Bill of Rights by the 13 sovereign colonies who had become states. We now find that the executive has put forward that the military ought and ultimately the police ought to take an oath of allegiance to him personally, to his power, to his branch, the executive branch. Recently, um, at certain stops out in the western part of the country, random stops or stops for speeding, people were searched without warrant, and they were searched without any cause but simply to be searched. This was ruled as unconstitutional in the local and the state venue, but was carried up and was overturned by the Supreme Court. When you're now stopped, there needs to be no warrant to search your person and your car. When you go to an airport, you can be searched for no other reason than that you were in an airport. The liberty, the freedom to be free from search and seizure of your person and of your assets, the right that was established and declared in the Bill of Rights is gone. And this is good continue to get deeper and darker as time goes along. It's not going to get better. Um, but we want to look and find out the cause of all this. What is the cause? It's national sin. It's a love of the creature more than the creator. It's a love of pleasure rather than a love of God, which has caused all this to happen. And you people that are angry because you say your rights have been violated, it's because you violated the sovereign power and the express will of God by committing sin. Do I mean they've overthrown the sovereign will of God? No. But they violated His express commandment against personal and national sin, and they've said that it is okay to commit sin, it is okay to live in sin, it is okay to worship sin, it is okay to worship self, and they've set themselves up pastors that teach the same. That's what they've done. The guilt ultimately is with every individual that loves sin more than the Savior, that loves unrighteousness, and loves gain, and loves physical mammon and reward, instead of God first. Because in this present time, and in every time that there's ever been, there seems to be a gain to the lost mind of a damned sinner in selling out Christ, and not acknowledging Christ, and not acknowledging the Word of God. There seems to be a material gain to do this. That's right. And so they do it. But the destruction comes upon them suddenly, ultimately, and they've died, a thousand generations have died, and where are they now? Our life is indeed but a vapor. Our days have been made as a hand's breadth in the sight of God. We have three score and ten or four score years, and yet their strength is labor and sorrow. And lack of a recognition of this, living like there is no tomorrow, like there is no judgment, so take what you can today, is destroying not just the unchristian people, but it's eating up and devouring people that profess to be the people of God. I make no assertion as to whether or not they are, but they profess to be the people of God. To consume things upon their lusts. To desire something more than righteousness and truth has led to what we now have. So James 1.23 through 1.25 For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. The Bible is a mirror. And when we hold up the Bible, and we view ourselves according to the word of God, we find that every man in his best state is altogether vanity. That there is none that doeth good, no, not one. That man by nature is nothing but a sinner and could be nothing but a sinner. He can do no good and no right. The preachers have not preached this. They've not told you this. They've lied. They've applied verses that apply only to the regenerate to the lost. 
They've said that if you just work these rules, it'll work for you. And that's not true. Amen. It only works. The truth only manifests itself in the heart of God's elect. And the promises are to the seed, and that's the seed of Christ. Those that are chosen in Him. No others. The verse 25 reads, Whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, the law of the Spirit and life hath made me free from the law of sin and death. The law of liberty in the New Testament is the law of the Spirit and life. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. The just shall live by faith. That is the law of the New Testament. It's not follow these outward commandments and obey them rigorously and in totality and thou shalt have life and be perfect. No, it's believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, live in faith towards Him, and that draws you out of a life of sin and into life in the Savior. Whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein. See, James is speaking of what is called the perseverance of the saints. Continuing therein. Amen. He being not a forgetful hearer, no saint, no Christian should ever forget how vile, how filthy, how wicked, how depraved their old man in their heart still is. You are not by nature a good person. And if there is any goodness in you, it only comes from God because He alone is good. Amen. And those that recognize Christ, but would not recognize Him as God manifest in the flesh, but simply as a man, call Him good master. And He said, why callest thou me good? Because that individual did not recognize Him as the Son of God. He recognized Him only as a Son of Man. He put the attribute of goodness, which belongs solely to the deity, onto the human nature of Christ alone, and not the divinity within Christ. This was His sin. This is His error. And this is why He went away very sad. Because He had great riches. You see, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What did Christ do? He turned that unelect sinner to the commandments, not to himself. Thou knowest the commandments. He said this, Did he not? All these have I kept from my youth up. And it profited in little. Those who profess to keep the law, and say they keep it, and do it, always turn backwards and walk away from Christ. Amen. Something's running above my head. <laughs> oh, a hornet. Well, at least we have those. Maybe they'll pollinate things. Um... <laughs> So, whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Those that do a work without faith and without following Christ and believing in Him are never blessed in their deeds. Okay. They receive their reward now, but they get none hereafter. They, get, they labor for a temporal crown, we for an eternal crown. They labor for their own selves, we labor in the vineyard of the Lord for Christ. For his glory, for his honor. John 8, 32 through 36. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. We had men in this country that knew the truth. It made them free, and they made the area, the land, and the people in whom they lived, and around whom they lived, free by their deeds. The freedom that was within broke into freedom that was without. Amen. There's no talk of that these days. There's no preaching of the Son shall make you free these days. There's a preaching of this is what you ought to do and this is how you ought to do it and then God will bless you. Honestly, truly, those who look for the blessing of God can and should only be those that are in Christ, serving Christ, and have been made free by Him. The rest are nigh unto cursing. They're thorns and briars. And ye shall know the truth, and the tr truth shall make you free. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, etc. Then Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. This nation is filled with servants of sin. They're going to exhibit it tonight. Tonight, they're going to exhibit it. They're going to listen to a sinner, a fornicating, adultery-committing sinner, during halftime, when they slouch out to get another barrel and continue their drunken orgy and feast as they worship the God of sports, they're going to listen to him sing, Born in the USA, and they're going to shout out, God bless America. <laughs> yeah, they will. I will agree with Obama's pastor on one thing, God damn America. I can agree with him on that. 
This country is worthy of damnation. Damned nation. It's worthy of damnation. Because they rejected the Son, they rejected the glorious liberty that is given to the children and the sons of God, and chosen a yoke of bondage for the filling of the belly and the loading of the wallet. And now you're going to lose what's in the belly and you're going to lose what's in your wallet. Because you chose that which profiteth not. You chose something other than God, and that's the choice of every natural man. Verily I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. If you want to live forever, you've got to be in the son. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Freedom. Amen. Liberty. The land of the free. For it to be a land of the free would have to be a land of regenerate persons who have been born again by the Spirit of God, who have been begotten again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It's not the land of the free and the home of the brave. It's the land of the slave and the home of the depraved. That's what it is. Amen. They're all servants to sin because they live in fear for their mortal flesh and they would rather have a mess of pottage than the birthright. Amen. The birthright is being given the adoptions of sons by Christ Jesus. Now, Galatians 5.1 says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty. This is what our fathers and grandfathers have not done. They could not stand fast in the liberty that was bequeathed to them by those that founded this country because they stood not fast in the liberty wherewith Christ could make a man free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. They went back to papal superstition. They went back to seeing an immediate gain as worth more than an eternal reward. They went back to trusting in the arm of the flesh instead of in the sword of the spirit. They turned aside onto lies. The Bible reads in 2 Corinthians 3.17, Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. These founding fathers, Washington, Adams, even Revere, and most of the rest of them, whether or not they had personal faith in Jesus Christ, they knew these things. And those that did know these things internally, that had been made free, pulled along the rest, that acknowledged why it's Franklin, the rank deist, someone that the order, the Jesuit order, likes and points to, and in fact, I'm not so sure that he wasn't a Jesuit. They point to him and his methodical examination of his own conscience at the end of every day to make himself better as a good example of a man that was not attached to the Jesuit order using the very same method that Ignatius came up with. Mm -hmm. An oddity. It's well known that the man lived in France and populated the French countryside with many bastards. That's right. There are even portraits of his bastards down below his home underneath the street in Philadelphia. What a glorious bequeathment to those that would follow after. He's known to be an unfaithful man, a whoremonger, a corpulent, ugly idolater, though a man bestowed upon by God with much natural genius. The one who founded our post office. The one who came up with the configuration of the fire company. And the one who discovered electricity and on and on it goes. Oh. I can't imagine many women today finding him very attractive, but apparently there was something in the man that caused fawning French frivolous women to just drool when he appeared. I will stop there on that. Uh, uh, Franklin should not be lifted up as a, an example to men. He should not be lifted up as a good man because he was not a good man. Mm -hmm. He was a bad man. I don't know why I got off on that, but I did. Um, now, before I proceed further and show what the direct secondary causes are of our fall from grace as a nation, I'm going to read some statements out of this little book, one of those dirty old books, moldy old books, damp standing. First, going to read just a tad, just a smidgen, just a touch 
of George Washington's farewell address. This should have been quoted by President Obama as he gave his inaugural address. He should have referenced it. If he was one spirit with these founding fathers and he is their descendant, certainly he should have mentioned it. Bush should have mentioned it. Clinton should have mentioned it. Bush Sr. should have mentioned it. Carter should have mentioned it. Ford should have mentioned it. They should have continued to look back to the precept, to the testimony that gave this nation such a freedom from foreign bondage. Um, against the insidious wiles of foreign influence, I conjure you to believe me, fellow citizens, the jealousy of a free people ought to be constantly awake, since history and experience prove that foreign influence is one of the most baneful foes of Republican government. But that jealousy to be useful must be impartial, else it becomes instrument, the instrument of the very influence to be avoided instead of the defense against it. Excessive partiality for one nation, one foreign nation, and excessive dislike of another cause those whom they actuate to see danger only on one side and to serve to veil and even second the arts of influence of the other. Real patriots who may resist the intrigues of the favorite are liable to become suspected and odious. Well, that sounds like the time in which we live. Real patriots who would have our nation be free of foreign entanglements are now judged to be suspected and odious, while its tools and dupes usurp the applause and confidence of the people to surrender their interests. Amen. This is precisely what is going on. Amen. See, we can look to the Word of God, and we can look to the Word of God as it actuated and lived in men of old to bring forth a personal physical liberty in our country and find out where we've gone wrong, where our posterity has gone wrong. Now, I'm going to uh, read next from Samuel Adams on American Independence um, this statement. We have no other alternative than independence or the most ignominious, ignominious and galling servitude. The legions of our enemies thicken our plains. Desolation and death mark their bloody career while the mangled corpses of our countrymen seem to cry out to us as a voice from heaven. Quotes. This is where he made up this quote. Will you permit our posterity to groan under the galling chains of our murderers? Has our blood been expended in vain? Is the only benefit which our constancy till death has obtained for our country that it should be sunk into a deeper and more ignominious vassalage? Recollect who are the men that demand your submission to whose decrees you are invited to pay obedience. Men who, unmindful of their relation to you as brethren, of your long implicit submission to their laws, of the sacrifice which you and your forefathers made, of your national advantages for commerce to their avarice, formed a deliberate plan to wrest from you the small pittance of property which they had permitted you to acquire. Remember that the man the men who wish to rule over you are they who, in pursuit of this plan of despotism, annulled the sacred contracts which they had made with your ancestors. Right. Right. That's what I just spoke of. An annulling of the sacred contract. Constitution. Conveyed into your cities a mercenary soldiery to compel, compel you to submission by insult and murder, who called your patience cowardice, your piety hypocrisy. Countrymen, the men who now invite you to surrender your rights into their hands are the men who have let loose the merciless savages to riot in the blood of their brethren, who have dared to establish popery triumphant in our land, who have taught treachery to your slaves and courted them to assassinate your children and wives. These are the men to whom we are exhorted to sacrifice the blessings which providence holds out to us, the happiness, the dignity of uncontrolled freedom and independence. Come on. Let me hear one of you boys up there in the Supreme Court read one of these. Amen. Why don't one of you people in the House read this into the record? Why don't you call to remembrance the former days and the affliction that those that loved their posterity and not just themselves, those that loved God first, and themselves second, 
wrought in this country, what they did for us, and what you've now undone. Lastly, Andrew Jackson on states, rights, and federal sovereignty, the second inaugural address. Now this is a far, far cry from the recent inaugural addresses of many of the past presidents. Why, old Ronnie. He swore his oath, looking off to the obelisk. The first one to so do. Looking off to the obelisk. But I want to read this, because this is amazing what Andrew Jackson said. They put his picture on a liquor bottle and call it Old Hickory. But I'll tell you something. He's the man that said that book is the rock on which the Republic rests, pointing to the King James Bible. Amen. Deeply impressed with the truth of these observations and under the obligation of that solemn oath which I am about to take, I shall continue to exert all my faculties to maintain the just powers of the Constitution and to transmit unimpaired to posterity the blessings of our Federal Union. At the same time, it will be my aim to inculcate by my official acts the necessity of exercising by the general government those powers only that are clearly delegated to encourage simplicity and economy in the expenditures of the government, to raise no more money from the people than may be requisite for these objects, and in a manner that will best promote the interest of all classes of the community and all portions of the Union. Constantly bearing in mind that in entering into society, individuals must give up a share of liberty to preserve the rest, it will be my desire so to discharge my duties as to foster with our brethren in all parts of the country a spirit of liberal concession and compromise, and by reconciling our fellow citizens to those partial sacrifices which they must unavoidably make for the preservation of a greater good, to recommend our invaluable government and union to the confidence and affections of the American people. Finally, it is my most fervent prayer to that almighty being before whom I now stand and who has kept us in his hands from the infancy of our republic to the present day, that he will so overrule all my intentions and actions and inspire the hearts of my fellow citizens that we may be preserved from dangers of all kinds and continue forever a united and happy people. Notice he speaks like a Calvinist. He asks for the divine providence to completely overrule his own actions. He commends himself to the hand of God in the execution of his public office in a very magnificent and yet simple way. That was the sort of man, and he broke the back of the National Bank. Amen. He stopped the National Bank. He died with lead in him from attempted assassination, and he kept our country free from foreign entanglements. The actual monetary system of the European bankers who were operating at the behest of others. Now, I've noticed in the Bible, and you might notice as well if you read it continually, not just casually, but as a student seeking to study and show yourself approved unto God, that prosperity, ease, abundance, abundance, and leisure are always a precursor to a fall from liberty, and always a precursor to the fall of kingdoms and nations. Look for a moment to Daniel chapter 5. This king, Belshazzar, made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. Before that very night was over, God weighed him in the balances and found him wanting, and the kingdom was given to another. The same thing can be seen of an army that went out to war in 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 16. And they went out at noon, but Ben-Hadad was drinking himself drunk in the pavilions, he and the kings, the thirty and two kings that helped him. Virtually all of his princes and his army were slain. They were enjoying idleness. They were sitting as if they were a queen and could be no widow. They were sitting as ones who thought themselves some great ones upon whom a calamity, upon whom a judgment could not fall. And that was the response of the American people to the event that happened in 2001 on September 11th, a high day of commemoration for the Jesuit order. Amen. Why is it a high day of commemoration for the Jesuit order? Because that was the day in 1537 
when the first initiates, and I use that term correctly, the first members of the Jesuit Illuminati celebrated Mass together as ordained priests. Isn't that just quinky dinky as Dr. Rutland used to say in his depth set the other day? Just a coincidence. It was a high day. It was a day to be much held in remembrance by them. And that's the day there was an immolation offered, a sacrifice. Yeah. Something else interesting, um, I wish I had that little printout, but we've now discovered, uh, Chris has turned up, that the Romish Church warns those that would be tar partakers of the Eucharist, if they have gluten allergies, they are not to partake because of potential lawsuits. A frank admission that it stays bread. Amen. When it comes to money, they'll throw aside all pretense to religion and faith. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? But yes, it was, I might say his name wrong, the Portuguese one, Bodabilla. Is that how you say his name? Bobadilla. Bobadilla. And his companions celebrated Mass on September 11, 1537, for the first time together as ordained priest without Ignatius. It was the first day a large group of them got together, and it was a large group, six or seven of them, got together and celebrated Mass as ordained priest. Ignatius, Salmeron, and Linus were elsewhere, but they, as a group, celebrated Mass after they had spent time in preparation and fasting and, you know, working up themselves in the flesh. Alex Jones didn't tell me that on 911 Road to Tyranny. <laughs> I don't think they got that loose change either, did they? Didn't know that, did you, Eric? No. I happened across that because I've got such a perverse mentality, and I like to read about the order in accounts by the order. They love to brag. That was written in 1962, though. Maybe he wasn't quite aware what was going to go on 30 years later or so in New York, 40 years later. Um, anyway, and it's amazing, isn't it? Just It was just a happenstance. There are, after all, only 365 days in a year sometimes. You know, we have a leap year day, but... I mean, there's only 365, and one out of 365, that's not the high of odds, right? Oh. That was a sign to every Jesuit all over the world that we're now going forward in a big way. They speak to one another through symbols, through signs. They don't speak in honesty and truth to one another openly. They speak through symbols and signs because that's what they're into. Well, prosperity, ease, and abundance, and leisure... We see, didn't do much for Sodom, did it? Look at Ezekiel 16, 49. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride. Remember, after 9-1-1, the power of pride? All over people's bumpers? Yeah. With plastic flags waving? Pride. Fullness of bread. A loaf of bread used to be a nickel. An abundance of idleness. Why, there's people all over this country that just aren't doing anything. Abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. Her sin was sitting on her haunches, doing nothing, being proud. And those that were poor and needy, she despised. Well, but our government takes care of the poor. Do they really? Well, from what I understand, they're going to take care of the poor all right when they're out of jobs and their benefits run out. They're going to take care of them. They're gearing up to take care of them. That's right. Mm -hmm. They're gearing up all right. And some of these people recently just shot themselves and killed their families because they couldn't support them. But when that becomes much more general, what's going to happen? Well, they get, they've got things planned. They're going to make sure that they execute the will of God upon sinners that love mammon more than truth, that love gain, and have a love of money more than a love of God. I know that it will be well with me in the day of evil. I know that though they're going to be heard in the stall, and the fields be barren, I will rejoice in the Lord my God. And at the last I will be raised in an incorruptible body. And I don't have a hope, though I do have that hope. I have more than that. I have a certainty. I have a certainty of the work that Christ did is true, and that His work overrules all the works of man. That is my hope, that is the certainty that I have, that Christ died for my sins according to the Scriptures. And only men that know that Christ 
died for their sins according to the Scriptures, that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Only those that know that and believe it in their heart and believe that He is the Word was made flesh and that in the beginning was the Word, the two are one, the Word of God and Christ, they are one and the same, and they have a lively hope. They don't believe the NIV, they believe the King James. They don't believe the NASB. They don't trust Pastor Hagee. They don't trust their own works. They don't trust their own righteousness. They don't trust hirelings. They don't trust dogs. They don't trust any preacher. They trust in God that raiseth the dead. Amen. Now, Revelation 17.2. See, there's a drunk in the Bible that has nothing to do with drinking. That's why these dirty sinners focus only on drinking. Why they've condemned all of my Puritan brethren, all of my Presbyterian brethren, all the men of old that fought a good fight and finished their course in faith. Amen. They've condemned our first president, George Washington, who regularly slept in taverns on his journey and no doubt took constitutional drinks of alcohol. Amen. Don't you tell me, sinner. Don't you, you sinner. <laughs> you self-righteous, hypocritical, once-married gelding. Your wife keeps your manhood in a jar. And only at her behest do you exercise it. Sinner. Amen. Dirty sinner. You've been gelded. You have the origin, origin for your father. Self-mutilating pervert. That's why you pervert the Bible. Um, anyhow, I'm not trying to make anybody laugh. I'm deadly earnest. Revelation chapter 17, verse 2. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with a wine of their fornication. This country is drunk with Romish wine. Amen. Oh, yes. It's high from the thrill of fornicating. That's what it's all about for them. There's a lot of different kinds of fornication. They've fornicated with stocks and stones, literally. These filthy, dirty pigs that advertise on TV for personal massages. Right. It's filthy! Amen. It's vile! Those are slap turns. Those are fornicate tricks. Those are pigs. Amen. They are not ladies talking about it one to the other. I always put those ads on 10, 11 o'clock at night, midnight. Slap turns sitting around discussing their pleasure. Slap turns. Look it up in an older dictionary. Filthy, dirty women. And these men, they want to see these girls gone wild. See girls gone wild and some of these female stormtroopers blow your brains out. they got female ones too, you know. Yeah. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk. With a, They're drunk, they're degraded, they're intoxicated. Oh, this country is so wonderful. It will never happen here. Our president will be our savior. Cursed be he that trusteth in man, Amen. and maketh flesh his arm. Amen. Well, Isaiah 29.9 Stay yourselves and wonder, cry ye out, and cry. They are drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. For the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep, and hath closed your eyes. The prophets and your rulers, the seers, hath he covered. And the vision of all has become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed. The King James Bible is a sealed book to almost all of them. Amen. Which men deliver to one and is learned to saying, Read this. Horowitz. Over there in the Ivy League. Sharpton. A black liberator. It's a sealed book to him. Amen. It's a sealed book to all of them, man. It's a sealed book to every member of the Senate and Congress. It's a sealed, closed book. George Bush, Sr., Jr., Ford, Carter, Amen. Nixon. Eisenhower, how far back? None of them had a clue what was going on with this book or what's in it. None of them. You shouldn't say that. You're going to get in trouble. Now, if I don't say it, I'll get in trouble. Amen. I'm going to answer to God, not man. I'm going to stand before God, not man. And these sinners that think that they can live and die in the flesh and be blessed are out of their minds. Amen. Whoso loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Whosoever keepeth his life shall lose it. That's what the Bible says. 
When you count yourself as but a dead man, then you truly live. But if you don't count yourself as but a dead man, and is dead in Christ, alive only uh, in this flesh to God through the Spirit, you're not alive. You're dead. And when you die, you'll be soon twice dead, plucked up by the roots. No eternal home in heaven. No glory. No blessing. I would trade some suffering here in a heartbeat for a thousand years to rule and reign my Savior and to see His smile and His blessing at the last. And not that I can earn it. He's already bestowed it. He's already given it. Who can take it away? Who can curse what God has blessed? You know, I think of the men of the past. I think of many great men of the past. I mean truly great men because they were great in the Lord. They didn't live long lives. They died. Even those that wrought great, valiant deeds for the Lord, they died terrible deaths. Cromwell saw his only favorite daughter. He had other daughters, but his favorite. She died a horrible death, and then he himself was poisoned. Amen. Many of his men, Rumbold, was taken up to a scaffold a couple months before the Glorious Revolution and executed. He was one of the Covenanters. He fought with Cromwell, though. Hutchison died in a jail. Ireton died, probably was poisoned. Amen. These great Puritan men died. Jonathan Edwards died from an inoculation. He didn't live out to be 70, 80 years old. My God took them home to be with him. Why fear death? Christ died for me. There is no fear in the death of the righteous. God is in the death of the righteousness and the death of the righteous, and he's in their resurrection as well. But God is not in all the thoughts of the wicked. He's far from them. They have no changes, therefore they fear not God. The book is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I am not learned. Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth, and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. The Pharisaic mode. Teach the fear of God by the precept of man. Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder. For the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. Those that are prudent and understand and know, their wisdom will be hid from the majority of the people, because God does not wish to bring salvation and deliverance to such a nation as this. Amen. The earth is also defiled. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. There is no everlasting covenant in the Bible. You either make covenant with the Lord or you don't. He has not made a covenant with himself in the person of the Father and the Son to bring salvation to all of God's chosen. There is nothing irrevocable. It's all changeable. They've broken the everlasting covenant. Yeah. That includes all the Protestant preachers. All the Protestant preachers. They've broken it. What did Jeremiah say? Chapter 2, verse 7. I brought you into a plentiful country to eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof. But when he entered, he defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. The priest said not, where is the Lord? And they that handled the law knew me not. Pastors also transgressed against me, and the prophets prophesied by Baal, and walked after things that do not profit. Wherefore I will yet plead with you, saith the Lord, and with your children's children will I plead. The end result of backsliding and turning from God in the pastors, in the prophets, in the priests, and I'll use those words, those are Bible words, is very plain destruction. Hosea 6 4. O Ephraim, what shall I do unto thee? O Judah, what shall I do unto thee? For your goodness is as a morning cloud, and as the early dew, it goeth away. The goodness of America is gone. De Talk Bell was quoted, and been quoted many times, as saying, America is great because she is good. When she ceases to be good, she will cease to be great. Amen. How could a country be good without God in it? Amen. Therefore have I hewed them by the prophets, the country has been warned repeatedly. And albeit some of those that have warned have been Armenians. But they've warned. 
that America would be destroyed. This is one of the great sins of the nation, one of the great sins of the preachers. Where are the Calvinist prophets that decry unto the nation the sin of the people? Where are those that believe in the eternal sovereignty of the everlasting God crying out? No, instead we've had the David Wilkerson's and those kind right. calling it out. But they've called it out. Mm -hmm. And they've said this place will be destroyed. And I've said for years this place will be destroyed. God said this, I have slain them by the words of my mouth, and thy judgments are as the light that goes forth. For I desired mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. But they like men have transgressed the covenant, they have dealt treacherously against me. And they transgressed that everlasting covenant, that covenant of God with his people. They've said that it's a covenant that man must effectuate, that a man must perfect. They've perverted the words of the living God, they preached lies in the name of the Lord and said that a man's power is greater than God's. Therefore, they're given into the hand of man. Right. Amen. Gilead is a city of them that work iniquity and is polluted with blood. And as troops of robbers wait for a man, so the company of priests murder in the way by consent, for they commit lewdness. Oh, isn't it amazing how the priests commit lewdness? Those that are supposed to be the spiritual men all the big shots, one after another, they've been convinced and convicted. Though never sent to jail, basically, for it, except for Jimmy Baker, of lewdness, of incontinence, and that of the most promiscuous kind, not with just female, but with males. You know, I think the Pope is sitting over there laughing. But there's someone sitting above him that's laughing, too. You ought to remember that. Ted Haggard been on TV over and over again talking about his inclinations. And I saw that dirty sinner, that lying dog that cannot bark, that man that loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. You know what that dirty dog said to Anderson Cooper? You know what he said? His confession to the priest. He said this. He said that he believed the Bible was the rule of life. He believes in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. And was he struggled with his inclinations and his desires towards men. He decided to fast and pray, read the Bible, and memorize more scripture, and everything got worse and not better. Mm. One of the marks of a reprobate. No answer to prayer. He yeah. said, when I went to counseling and helped me sort it out. <laughs> yeah. And they just glory in that. They like to give him a whole hour. First he gets an hour on Larry King, and he gets an hour on Anderson Cooper. It's, it's sickening. And this is your event. And Anderson says, of course, there are many evangelical Christians that are gay and are comfortable with their Christianity and with their gayness. Oh, really? They have nothing to do with this book. Amen. I know that. They go to the MCC, and they won't touch a King James Bible. They use the NIV. Um, well, what did Jeremiah say in 529? And also elsewhere, two other times, Shall not I visit for these things, saith the Lord? Shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? A wonderful and horrible thing is committed in the land. It's basically a horrible thing there. The translators put the word wonderful in as part of the description of the word horrible. And it means it's something to be wondered at. It's something to be noted. It's something to be taken into close consideration. A wonderful and horrible thing is committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, peace and safety. And the priests bear rule by their means, the precept of man. And my people love to have it so. Amen. Those that say they are God's people want to hear from man, not God. And what will you do in the end thereof? <laughs> what are you going to do when it's all over? Yeah. That's the question. Malachi 2.7, For the priest's lips should keep knowledge, and they should seek the law at his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But ye are departed out of the way. Ye have caused many to stumble at the law. They've taught the law as a rule of life, instead of as a schoolmaster to lead you to Christ. 
Ye have corrupted the covenant of Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore have I also made you contemptible and base before all the people. Why? Evangelical preachers are all shown to be base and contemptible before the people. Base and contemptible. According as ye have not kept my ways, but have been partial in the law. Later on, Malachi chapter 3, verse 15, and now we call the proud happy. I guess Anna Nicole Smith was happy, huh? A proud sow. I imagine Patrick Swayze's happy right about now. When you're in the Lord, the day of your death is better than the day of your birth. Amen. You, that's terrible to say that. You're rejoicing that men are dying. No, I'm not. But I'm not rejoicing their iniquity. I don't know that man personally. But I don't hear any testimony of Jesus Christ. Of course, if he had one, you wouldn't hear it. It would get deep-sixed. It Amen. would disappear. It would Amen. be buried. Now we call the proud happy. Yea, they, they that work wickedness are set up. Yea, they that tempt God are even delivered. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it. And the book, I want to be in the Lord's book of remembrance, and I am. I don't want to be remembered by man. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that fear the Lord and thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. God spares the righteous, not from death, but through death. Often the righteous perish at the hands of the wicked, but they are spared in death, through death, unto life. Time of harvest is come in this nation, and it's going to be a bitter harvest. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full, the fats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Joel 3.13 because I have called, and ye refused. I have stretched out my hand, and no man regarded. But ye have said not all my counsel, and would none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity, and I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind. When distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. That doesn't apply to you who've hearkened unto the voice of the Lord, Amen. have known His ways, and walked in Him, and loved Him, and served Him, and been begotten again of Him. And all those things I just said are fruits of knowing Him and being begotten again. It applies to those that wouldn't answer. And so much for your name it and claim it. When your fear cometh as desolation, your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. God says of his own people, before they call, I will answer. Amen. Of those that are not his people, individuals now, he says, they shall call upon me, but I will not answer. So much for the purpose-driven puke, the purpose-driven life, the purpose-driven church. So much for applying positive verses for positive people, for positive ends. For, they, they, for that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel, they despised all my reproof. This is a book of reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. There is a way which seemeth right on a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. There is a way that seems right on this nation, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Amen. I already have eternal life as a present possession. The Lord giveth, and the Lord does not take that away. The Lord gives life, the Lord gives prosperity, and the Lord takes those things away. But eternal, everlasting life is something that was started with Him, is done by Him, works in man, and returns to glorify God. And that I have an assurance and I have a constant confidence and hope. Acts 2.40 In light of all these things, what manner of persons ought we to be? Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Amen. Untoward there means crooked. These are crooked people. Their ways are as crooked as a snake on a rock. The snake can be moving forward, but his path is crooked. Philippians 2.14 
Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. That's your duty as a soldier of Jesus Christ. And if you would war good warfare, you're to be punctilious, and you're to be very methodical in personal holiness and righteousness in your dealings with others. You're to love God. You're to fear God. You're to obey His commandments as laid out in the New Testament and honor Christ with your whole being, with your whole substance. There is safety in that. There is protection in that. I'm not looking for a man to protect me. Amen. No man can keep me from death. No man can keep me alive. It's only the Lord that upholdeth any of His children. And at such time as He sees fit, He will take them home to be with Him. But Jeremiah lived and survived the destruction that was in Judah. He went forward under the hand of an enemy general and was given liberty Amen. to go wherever he would go. He had liberty in the midst of bondage. He was given peace and a comfort and a consolation in the midst of destruction. And I believe that those of God's people that have not been ordained to go home in the coming conflagration, the coming destruction, who have not been ordained to be physically buried in coffins made of plastic after a biological or nuclear attack, I say it like George Bush or not. <laughs> um, those people are going to see the mighty hand of God. Those that believe in the sovereignty of God are going to be able to understand and know. I don't look forward to having an empty belly. I don't look forward to not having any water to drink. Do you look forward to that? No. But if we drank of the water of the Word of God, we live forever. And therefore, men can't kill us. All they can do is be used of God to give us our promotion in due season. Amen. When man kills a Christian, he thinks he is doing God's service. But really, all it is is God saying, Come up hither. So what is our job? We just, we're going to shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life. The word of life that we may rejoice, that Paul said, I may rejoice but that we might rejoice as well in the day of Christ, though we have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Well, mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this time. We thank Thee for Thy mercy. We thank Thee for Thy grace. And we just pray that Thou wouldst uh, keep us unto uh, eternal life in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.